Okay, so our next panel is going to discuss emerging state and national efforts to identify and report measures that reflect the health of primary care and how they're being used by decision makers to re reorient systems toward primary care and to drive needed change. Um, the promulgation for these measures was actually the NASM report recommendation, which is a common theme throughout, throughout the couple of days that, uh, that we've been all here. Um, I'm going to invite Jennifer Lee, Larry McNeely, Rachel Block, and Barbara Rabson to the stage. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lee, and I serve as the Chief Medical Officer for the Alliance of Community Health Plans. Uh, we represent nonprofit provider aligned community health plans across the country. And our plans are very committed to strengthening primary care and increasing the investment in primary care, especially in value based primary care arrangements. Um, and, uh, and we know that, that it is one of the few areas in healthcare where more spending leads to better health. And so that's why we're, we're very committed to seeing a doubling in primary care investment by the year 2030. Um, I'm also, uh, uh, personally speaking, a, a practicing emergency physician, so I can attest personally to the direct negative impacts on patients um, who I, I see in the ER when they don't have access to uh, primary care, and also the negative a uh, aspects on the system with increased wait times and all the other issues that happen when we don't have a strong primary care backbone. Uh, and so that is why I'm uh, really delighted to be here with you this morning and moderating uh, what I think will be a very interesting discussion on measuring the health of primary care. And uh, what I'll do is introduce our three wonderful panelists sequentially and give them a chance to provide uh, some remarks uh, to talk about the work that they are doing both in the, the state and federal level uh, and to offer some general comments. We'll go into some panel, to some discussion on the panel and save time for questions at the end via the, the Slido app. All right, so to start off, I'm gonna introduce Larry McNeely. So Larry is PCC's Director of Policy. And in his role, he helps shape and advance the policy agenda uh, for the group with the goal of building a comprehensive team-based and patient-centered primary care system. He coordinates the Policy and Advocacy Committee and Behavioral Health Integration Committees. In the past, his career uh, has included policy leadership roles at the American Diabetes Association, the Maryland Department of Health, and the National Coalition on Healthcare. To you, Larry. Um, well, it's, if it's time to go ahead then, I'll just say um, I'm going to start by going back to a bit of an origin story of an idea about how we measure the health of primary care. And it, um, in my memory, or in my understanding, um, a key piece of this, you know, yesterday we heard origin stories about PCC and how Paul Grundy and uh, some <coughs> of the uh, physician societies were having commerce, employers were having conversations forming PCC. Well. Uh, that same decade, somewhere around that time, there was an insurance commissioner in the state of Rhode Island by the name of Chris Kohler, uh, who uh, <clears throat> had the notion that while they were looking at and approving uh, uh, the various insurance filings that happen every year as a matter of course in that particular state, that one measure that it was going to be important to look at was whether... Uh, you know, what percentage of the resources these plans were spending were, was actually being devoted to primary care. And at that state, they finally took some action uh, and began to leverage that process, not only to measure, but then to increase the investment in their commercial uh, uh, market in primary care to encourage patient-centered medical homes and new models of payment. And uh, over time, uh, I think they've come pretty close to doubling their uh, investment in that particular segment of their market. I think 
do have some work to do in uh, uh, Medicaid these days still. Um, but fast forward to about 2017, 2018, around the PCC table, we were looking at what was going on federally, but we made a decision with the stakeholders at our table to focus on that same metric across the country. We'd seen a state in Oregon across the country pick up this idea of measuring the level of investment in primary care and saying, hey, we're creating these coordinated care organizations. We want them to have at least 12% of the resources going to these CCOs um, serving the safety net in Oregon needs to be in primary care. We said, this is a good idea. Maybe we could get state advocates together with the stakeholders at our table, the experts at Millbank, and we, uh, in partnership with Rachel Block and uh, uh, Chris Kohler by that time, I think, had taken uh, his leadership role at the Millbank Memorial Fund, began to convene quarterly calls to elevate this idea. And uh, what has happened then since, as we've continued these quarterly calls, some convenings where we can learn and served as kind of a support organization for this growing interest in measuring and then increasing at the state level the investment in primary care um, from those two states uh, in Oregon and Rhode Island, uh, we I can now count to 20 states around this country who have taken steps to either measure across payers the level investment in six states actually set in regulation or in statute a percentage target of total medical spending that needs to go to primary care. Um, uh, 16 of them are system-wide, four of them it's Medicaid only. Uh, and now our Better Health Now campaign in one fashion is really conceived as a way to challenge our federal officials to do the same, whether that be in uh, Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, uh, we certainly need Medicare to do more. So, um, you know, I think we're excited to, to see similar and other metrics to address the real health of primary care as much as we're looking at the health of patients at the practice level. Let's look at the system as a whole. Yeah. So along the lines of what Mason is recommending. Thank you, Larry, and thanks for pointing out that um, that, that is uh, the focus of this panel is, is in terms of measurement, not measuring the health of uh, the quality of the primary care delivered or the health of patients the primary care outcomes um, uh, among patients, but really the health of, of primary care overall. And we'll get into a discussion of uh, what that looks like and some of those measures. But I wanna introduce our, our next wonderful panelist. So we have Barbara Rabson here. Uh, Barbara is the president and CEO of the Massachusetts Health Quality Partners, MHQP. Under her leadership, MHQP has become one of the most trusted names in performance measurement and public reporting of healthcare information in Massachusetts and in the nation. She led MHQP to issue three first in the nation statewide public releases of hospital and physician performance information, including the first in the nation collaboration with Consumer Reports to release result performance results on primary care physicians on a statewide patient experience survey. So uh, we're delighted to have you here and Barbara. Give you Thanks some time so much. Mic. It's a great honor to be here, so thank you, thank you all. So I'm here to share how Massachusetts Health Quality Partners went from measuring physician performance to measuring the health of, or, from measuring the primary care performance to measuring the health of primary care. And MHQP is a multi-stakeholder organization and our mission is to drive improvements in patient experiences of care. And since 2006, we've been measuring um, patient experiences with primary care as well as primary care performance on clinical thesis metrics. And we do this throughout the state of Massachusetts for over 500 primary care and primary care adult and pediatric practices. And our data is used by the practices to help drive their improvement. It's used by the health plans to for their incentive payments. And we publicly report the data so that patients can look at our website and help they can help inform their healthcare choices. So four years ago, we convened a, a, a group of stakeholders to talk about patient engagement and affordability. We wanted to understand what are barriers that prevent patients from getting the right care at the right time in the right place. 
And the, the key barrier that came out was access. If they don't have access to primary care, they're going to go to the emergency department or other places. Um, other barriers include lack of trust in the healthcare system, lack of transparency, lack of health literacy on the part of patients, and also lack of patients' capacity to navigate like such a ridiculously complicated healthcare system that we have. So as access was the biggest barrier, we went to our primary care docs and said, okay, we'd like to talk to you about what you can do about e extending your access for primary care. And the reaction was, they kind of froze. They were like, you know what? We cannot do one more thing. This is 2019, and it was after the first mass health waiver and all these practices that are collecting social determinants of health information. There's just numerous measures, and, and it's just endless. And, and we were like, whoa, if primary care is this fragile, we need to start talking about this because it's the foundation of our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And so we convened a round table to talk about the future of primary care in Massachusetts and um, started talking about what our vision was for primary care in Massachusetts and how we might get there. And then our governor, Charlie Baker, introduced some legislation that said we should implement, um, or we should, uh, we should expand payment to primary care, increase primary care and behavioral health spending by 30%. So that was a great boost when he submitted this legislation and we started talking about, okay, well, what would we invest it in? And then the COVID pandemic hit. And as you all know, it is just incredibly devastating on primary care practices. And uh, Becca Etz at the, at the Green Center has done just such a marvelous job on documenting exactly how devastating the COVID pandemic was on, on primary care. So primary care, which was already fragile going into the, to, to the COVID pandemic, um, you know, and now is devastating. And the thing was, there was no way to tell. Like you couldn't go somewhere and look and say, okay, what's, what's, how's, how's COVID impacting primary care? There's no place to look. So at that point, we decided we needed to pivot and, and from measuring the performance of primary care to measuring the health of primary care. And we interviewed dozens of people about, okay, if we were gonna measure the health of primary care, what would that look like? And we came up with literally hundreds of metrics that people felt would be, a, would be important. And um, from that, we came, we decided, we've honed it down to about 30 some metrics. And we have four domains, um, and those domains are <clears throat> excuse me, financing or investment, performance of primary care, capacity of primary care, and equity of primary care. And these four domains are the same ones that um, Ariadne Labs, um, that Asaf Bhattan has led on an international level in terms of looking globally at primary care. So we said, okay, we are on the right track if we're looking at the same kind of things. And, and then the Nason report came out, and they, there's a number of overlaps in the measures that they're tracking nationally and what we're proposing. So for example, having a user, usual source of care is something we're both looking at, but it's not complete overlap. And so um, just backing up when the governor decided to uh, submit his legislation around increasing 30% more in primary care and behavioral health, the state agency that, that tracks the data, we have the all payer, it has the all-payer claims database. It's called the Center for Health Information and Analysis. They said, okay, as Larry has said, we need to figure out how much, we're, how much of our total medical expense goes to primary care spend. So they've been working at this for several months. And so we approached Chia and um, have formed a partnership where they're providing the payment data and we're, we're working together on all the other domains of care. And we will be releasing our first dashboard of the health of primary care in Massachusetts on January 10th. So we're really excited. And um, I wanted to share just a draft slide of what this is gonna look like. You'll see it's draft because it still has some Latin writing on it. So, but if you could pull that up, I wanted to, um, actually, can you, oh, that's not it. Okay, can you, can you see that? No, okay, so um, you see the four domains. And here are some of the data points that um, our goal was to say, okay, we're getting this data out there. Primary care leads to better quality, lower costs, better equity, and uh, the primary care system we have is not strong enough and it's getting weaker. And so these data 
uh, start to present that picture all in one place. And so on the finance side, um, primary care spend in Massachusetts overall is 10%, but it's going down across all insurance categories between 2019 and 2020. Medicare Advantage, now this, this, this is like a jaw dropper, had the lowest primary care spend at 4.6%. Can you imagine? 4.6%. And the number of specialists patients have when they don't go to primary care, who is it that's coordinating all these specialty visits but the primary care clinician? So this, this, is, this is really just um, unacceptable. In terms of capacity, Massachusetts actually has a higher rate of physicians um, leaving primary care than the, the rest of the country. We have um, a growing number of primary care physicians who are aging into their 60s, and, and that number is increasing. And we have, in terms of performance, more than a third of residents reported they had difficulty obtaining preventive care services in the past 12 months. And um, from an equity perspective, across all, all dis, um, access and utilization issues, uh, blacks and Hispanics and Asians had worse access and utilization. And in 2021, six, only 64% of Hispanic residents reported that they had a preventive care visit in the last year versus 81% for white residents. So this gives you a sense of what we're doing. These are all publicly available data. We've been working for close to a year trying to gather all these data points, and the, um, the national data has been helpful. Um, not all the data that we have is available in other places, but um, we would love to work with other states that are interested in doing this to see you know, how they might uh, go through the process we did, because the, the important thing is that um, we have to be able to monitor what's going on in primary care, and if we don't start with some baseline data, we can't do that, and we won't be able to tell like what, what's happening, and, and it's just too important, and to quote uh, Catherine Gergen Bennett, who's here, you measure what you treasure. So thank you very much. Wow, amazing. Thank you, Barbara. Congratulations on the dashboard, and uh, also very disturbing what it's um, uh, reflecting for us. But um, thank you so much for sharing about your, your work and for your leadership. Uh, I want to introduce our third panelist and give her a chance as well to talk about her work. So we have with us Rachel Block. Rachel is a program officer at the Millbank Memorial Fund, uh, and she focuses there on state health policy issues. And she has previously served in numerous executive roles in both the public and private sectors, including as Deputy Commissioner for Health IT in the New York Department of Health and Founding Executive Director of the New York eHealth Collaborative. She's also worked at CMS, where she directed policy and operations for Medicaid and SCHIP, and also was the Founding Executive Director for the Vermont Healthcare Authority. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, you, you know, you're all familiar with the uh, line about standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, as we were beginning our work on the National Health of Primary Care Scorecard, Barbara contacted us and let us know what Massachusetts Health Quality Partners was interested in doing, and it really uh, helped to shape our thinking and our approach. Uh, so thank you, Barbara, for sharing uh, that. Uh, but Barbara is also, uh, the, bar the work that Barbara's organization is doing is also a great example of some of the applications that we hope will result from having uh, a standardized national scorecard. I, I think by now you're all familiar with the NASM definition of high quality primary care, uh, eight attributes. If we had one a national data set that could capture all of that information at a granular and standardized level, then Millbank Memorial Fund would not have to lead the effort to create a national scorecard for the health of primary care. Uh, but that uh, does not exist. We also have the objectives uh, that NASM articulated. Again, I'm not going to repeat that because they've been referenced many times so far at this meeting. But those two things, that definition, those attributes, as well as the objectives, really provide the guiding light for us in terms of how we are thinking about approaching uh, the health of primary care uh, scorecard. As Jennifer said, at first, we did have to clarify this was not about evaluating how well primary care is performing at an individual primary care practice level, but rather these global measures of how do we assess 
uh, how well the primary care system is operating. But as Barbara said, it reminds us that we already have a lot of good data uh, to make the case stronger to improve primary care and to ensure accountability. And that's really where the NASM report placed the work on the scorecard, was in the accountability category, that last group. And it basically said it, HHS should be doing certain things to improve primary care. You heard about that yesterday. But that also there should be a national public-private effort to assemble this scorecard. And so that is what Millbank is helping to lead. But I have to say we're also humbled by the challenges, even though the committee did awesome work to give us not only the roadmap, the definitions, the objectives, they also handed us a starter set of what all those potential measures or data sources might be. Uh, but as we have learned, uh, uh, and as Barbara indicated, uh, there are many data sets. Uh, they're not standardized. And through our expert advisory committee, we've come to learn that there are significant, albeit small, differences in terms of how certain things are categorized. So we've had to try to sort through what is the optimal measure given what we have to work with today. We also had to confront the challenge that we have, notwithstanding all of this data, we have limited data in certain respects. And just two that I will mention, which is a big focus for the scorecard. One is that we would like to have as many of these measures as possible rendered at the state level. Because as the report indicated, and Millbank certainly uh, works towards, we feel that states play a very important role in galvanizing support for improved primary care across all of those NASM objectives. So we need that state level data, but many of these national data sets are not reportable at a state level. And then finally, as we think about the full range of primary care functions described by NASM and the composition of the team, very few data sources that give us information to adequately measure all of those things. So to navigate these challenges, we of course turned to other giants we wanted to stand on the shoulders of. We hired the Robert Graham Center to help as our an analysis partner to assemble and evaluate and walk through all of the different options that we had. Uh, we have a funding partnership, which we're very grateful for from the Physicians Foundation, which has committed to two years of, of funding support for this project, complementing what Millbank is doing. And then finally, as I indicated, an advisory committee, which is representative of the domain's uh, subjects in research and practice that are covered. Again, you are familiar with the objectives, but just to review how we think about them from the scorecard organization. Finance, how is primary care being paid for? Access, how are people accessing and using primary care? Training, a topic of uh, the conversation earlier today. Health information technology, referenced in the digital innovation roundtables you just had. And then finally, uh, research. Now, uh, we're not quite ready to publish the first scorecard. We're, we're working hard on it. But I can share some findings with you. Um, and I'm sorry to say that there will be very few surprises for this audience. Because what we found in this initial baseline analysis is primary care investment is low, and it is highly variable among payers and by state. You heard already from the Robert Graham Center and PCC Usual source of care has declined. We also have data to show that access in medically underserved areas has proportionally declined as well. So those very places where we need the most primary care, particularly today. Training, not well distributed and very limited in community settings, meeting that criteria of where people work and live. And then finally, uh, the pittance uh, that we spend as a nation uh, on research. So that's a very quick overview of the process uh, that we have followed. We are planning to release the data, um, I'm sorry, the scorecard in February. Um, we will also release an interactive dashboard that will provide as granular access to that information as we can possibly supply. Our next steps beyond that are to coordinate with HHS around the dashboard that they're developing for their own accountability around these measures. 
to identify areas where the scorecard can be improved, and we welcome feedback once all this information is made available to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Amazing. Um, so we're going to get into some questions, but I think Larry had wanted to reflect a bit on. You know, first of all, I, you know, one of the things I come to this uh, conference, in addition because I have the great fortune to work for the members of uh, PCC, is to be inspired by what we hear here. And if I, everyone here I know has a stake in primary care, if you're either inspired by the work that's happening in Massachusetts or in some of these other states, I mentioned Rhode Island and Oregon and the 18 other states, or what uh, Milbank and the Robert Graham Center are doing, I just want to put a pin in a couple of notions. From what we've learned at PCC, the states that have made real progress at the state level have been able to do it by bringing together what we brought together here, a multi-stakeholder conversation. But there's always been some uh, names that I failed to lift up in my initial remarks that were really key to those conversations to drive primary care investment. Folks like the AFP chapters in all the various states have been a lot very effective. And the table differs from state to state, but we did some qualitative research a couple years ago, found that it was that multi-stake. My second notion, and if my colleague was to pull up a couple of slides, if you want to monitor what other states are doing in terms of legislation on primary care investment specifically, there's a web tool that with Milbank support, and we're trying to work together as much as possible, PCC has just been able to uh, put it up on our website. And before we get done today, I know we'll uh, give you a sneak peek uh, and look at that. But again, um, I just want to invite a realm of, uh, round of applause for the work that Milbank had, has done, and uh, the Health Quality Partners in uh, Massachusetts have done. Um, already. So, thank you. Well, I agree. I am uh, both inspired and, as I was telling Barbara earlier, a little jealous, always a little jealous of Massachusetts. I was, as a former state Medicaid director in my home state of Virginia, we always look to states like Massachusetts to, to see um, what the future should be like for us. So I'm and, and very thankful to Milbank for um, your leadership, support, and, um, and guidance for, for uh, all states. Um, we have some questions coming in, but I uh, wanted to, to at least touch briefly on uh, data because that's been mentioned a few times and that's uh, always where you start to get, uh, uh, things get a little sticky when you're talking about measures. Um, so we do have a lot of data. We also have a lot of measures. Um, can, you talk, can you talk a little bit about uh, where the measures that you're using for the scorecards, uh, what, what data sets, are you uh, pulling from for those? What data gaps are you finding? Uh, what can we do to solve some of those uh, d data challenges that, that you may be facing? Yeah. Well, I'll start with the, the data that's unique to Massachusetts that um, partly because of the work that MHQP has been doing for the last 25 years and partly because of our state agency. So um, in terms of performance, we have um, some access and care issues and the data comes from a statewide patient experience survey that Massachusetts conducts that I mentioned when we ask patients about their experiences with primary care and then ask patients about getting access to care and, and the quality of communication and so forth. We've been surveying commercially insured patients for the last 15 years. We have a contract with MassHealth um, to survey uh, Medicaid members about their patient experience um, as, part of, as, as part of the waiver for the last five years, and that will continue in the next part of the waiver. So those are some uniquely Massachusetts um, data points. Um, one of the things that uh, CHIA does is they have a, um, what they call a Massachusetts health insurance survey that they conduct every other year. It's pretty similar to a survey that's done, the MEPS, I believe, and California has a version of it when the, the source of the usual source of care question comes from these surveys of patients, and so that's something that we've been able to, um, to use, and that's stratified by race and ethnicity, which is really helpful on, on the equity side. Um, the, it's interesting, CHIA, when they started measuring um, the 
the, the SPANF, primary care SPANF, even though they own the all pay, payer claims database or Massachusetts, they have the authority to ask health plans for any data they want. And so they actually did a separate request of health plans to get the data in a slightly different way. So, so there might be some differences across states if some states are using the all payer claims database and, and, and Chia did, did a different kind of request. Um, then there's some national sources that the, the Graham Center has been very generous, you know, that is gathering on the national level. And so we went to them and, and in some cases this data is stratified by um, by different states, not all of it, but some of it. And so there is a fair amount of data that you all can get that once the, you know, that report, the national scorecard comes out, there's, there's state level data. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things. One of the ch biggest challenges for us, I mean, there was more data about physicians than the rest of the team. And mm -hmm. so one of the things we found that there's a group in Massachusetts uh, monitoring community health workers who work in primary care. Like, who knew? But that's a resource that, that happens to exist, and you know, maybe it exists in your communities as well. And so it's, you know, part of it is a little bit um, just following every lead in terms of, of, of getting the data out there, and it's been a, it's been a while, and it's a gradual process. But um, as I said, I'm happy to talk to everybody about how, how we did this and um, encourage others to do it, because it, it's, it's going to be really powerful, we hope. Rachel, do you want to comment? Also, we have a, a question that builds on this that came in. Um, is Massachusetts and our, our mill bank using the same data definitions and elements in your dashboard? And mm -hmm. As Barbara indicated, we're certainly coordinating. And uh, really, for any of the uh, groups or efforts across the country that are interested in these things, we are all talking to each other. So the good news is that we at least have that level of communication. As I said, though, our guiding star comes directly from the NASM report. And so when it comes to the specifics of the uh, constellation of measures and data sources that were identified initially for us to work from, you can look at the appendix to the report. It's, it's quite detailed. We took that appendix and distilled that down to a much smaller set. But in general, because it is intended to be the nationally representative health of primary care scorecard, we do have to stick with some framework that applies at a national level. And so as a result, we are generally relying on surveys, which many of you are quite familiar with, uh, medical expenditure panel survey being a primary source, one that Robert Graham Center and PCC have published regularly uh, using analysis from that. But because we had this great advisory committee as well as the Graham Center staff to draw from in terms of their expertise, we were able to evaluate the pros and cons of some of the nuances of similar measures, looking at similar issues from either Nas National Health Insurance Survey, uh, from NAMSES, from BRFIS. Uh, I'm sure, again, many of you are familiar with these uh, national data sets. So we are at this point finalizing all of this but I will say we are certainly committed to coordination and to alignment to the maximum extent that we can achieve that while uh, achieving uh, the NASEM goals. Yeah. I would also say that um, I know that the Graham Center is doing this and MHQP will have a very detailed specification on every data element that we have in, included in the dashboard so that anybody can go and say, okay, here's the source um, and, and track it down. So that's, that's something that's, that's really important. And we will, of course, have that legacy built into uh, our report and also the dashboard. Mm -hmm. well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just zooming out <coughs> a bit, moving from the dashboard world to the legislative and regulatory world where at the state level we're trying to measure overall expenditures on primary care relative to medical spend. One increasingly salient part of the conversation, and we know uh, high quality advanced primary care does include behavioral health care, it's integrated, it's whole person. Um, that's not necessarily how everybody conceives of it, uh, but uh, there are conversations going on in states about how also do we make sure our healthcare dollars are resourcing our behavioral health work. Um, some states now are saying, you know what, we should be tracking both. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think we heard yesterday that there's now in the state of Massachusetts a waiver that's uh, 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 a waiver that has a standard 
just as some states have set standard, hey, we need X percentage of our health spend on primary care. In that Massachusetts Medicaid waiver, 1115 waiver, they said, um, you know, we want our Medicaid, our base Medicaid payment for primary care, behavioral health, and OB to be at a certain percentage of Medicare um, uh, rate. So, you know, these conversations about how much we're investing that start with that data start to become really salient for the resources we need to transform care and transform payment in the state. Mm -hmm. so. well, Jennifer, can I just add one other thing, which I think uh, ties in with a couple of the questions we've received so far. So one of our other commitments, um, although it wasn't explicit in the ASIM report, was to try to the maximum extent possible to use publicly available data sources mm -hmm. so that not only could people validate themselves, whatever it was that we came up with, but also be able to create their own formulations, but using uh, their own access to those data sources. However, what we found as we went through the process is that not all of the measures that we wanted to capture uh, were really available in those publicly uh, available data sources. And I'll just mention some of the workforce uh, and training related information comes from AMA data sources, from ACGME, and some other places, uh, which you have to purchase access to. So um, we, through our arrangement with Graham Center, have been able to access that information, but it, it doesn't quite neatly fit with that category of publicly available, transparent data sources. Also, as I think you all appreciate, it was referenced in a couple of presentations, um, it would be great if we could have standardized information about some of these workforce statistics from <coughs> states who do the licensing of all of these professionals. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think, as I said, in terms of areas for improvement, uh, we will explore questions about whether and how we could access some of those existing state data sources that we just did not have the time and, and capacity to do for this first version of the scorecard. Mm -hmm. So we recognize that there are some data sources that are not public and, and transparent in the same manner, and also that there are additional data sources we might be able to tap in the future. Mm -hmm. I would also say one of the really big challenges about compiling a dashboard and communicating it to the world is they're like, so? <laughs> and you know, and, and it's really, I mean, we don't have what we're striving for. I mean, do we know that if we reach 25% of total spend on primary care, then we'll meet the, you know, the goals that we have for high quality and lower cost? We, I mean, th th it's not as though in this country we have a place to say, okay, see, if we do this, then we'll get to that. So I think that's one of the challenges we have as, you know, but as we put it out, we can say this, not only do we know it's low and, and look at all the, the direction is going down in every case, and in a lot of cases that's because of the pandemic, but, but you can't say, well, then it doesn't matter, you know, it, it's, the pandemic was devastating to primary care, and that's why we're measuring primary care, and, or one of, one of the reasons, and so it's going in absolutely the wrong direction, but in terms um, of really trying to get the data and the, you know, the research done so we can say, okay, we do know what we're striving for, mm -hmm. and as a country, we could say, okay, let, you know, this is what it should be, and this is unacceptable. And so in the beginning, this is like, okay, we're getting this out there, we're drawing attention to this, we're saying we have to monitor this, we're saying, you know, clearly, um, you know, educating people about it. And um, one of the sort of interesting challenges we have is as we think about putting this out to the public, how do we define primary care? Mm. And there's a lot of definitions, you know, NASM, the Primary Care Collaborative, the World Health Organization, a lot of them are really aspirational. And so people don't necessarily relate to them when they say, you know, you could all these different. And so it's like, whoa, we've got work to do. And so, you know, when you really think about um, how do you relate to the public in terms of this and what's the important, and it clearly has something to do about with relationship. And I was so impressed with our patient who launched this conference and her articulating of, you know, what's important about primary care, and I jotted that down because I was like, okay, we can, we can use her language. But there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of work to do, and, you know, we're not going to get it all right at first, but we're going to, you know, start and then keep going and build on it and build on it and build on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The devil's always in the details, <coughs> as, as you know. Um, there's a lot of interest in the audience about uh, the HHS primary care, primary health care dashboard, and I know... Rachel, you mentioned that there's good coordination happening, but will when your scorecard 
uh, comes out in February, then sometime later, will there be an HHS dashboard? Do we expect to see one? And what do you hope to see in that that um, may be similar or different from yours? I don't know if you could share some thoughts on that. Well, we're actually meeting with Dr. Steinberg in a couple of days <laughs> to talk about that exactly. So uh, I think we, we will figure that out. But uh, I just would mention Dr. Steinberg is a member of our advisory committee. And so she certainly had visibility into all the discussions that we've had about both the scope and the methodology uh, that we've used uh, for the scorecard so far. But this is a little bit of TBD as we are just going to start to learn more about what will be in the task order. Great. Let me just from uh, my personal perspective, I just wanna lift up and say how important it is that this work is being done even in advance of our goal, which is potentially a public function. Um, uh, and it's something that I think is aligned with NASM if the federal government were to do this uh, systematically. But, you know, if you, you can't, you won't be able to, you measure what you treasure, or you treasure what you measure, to Catherine's point. We need this information collectively as a society, have the conversation about uh, resources, to have the conversation about equity, to have the conversation about are we getting value, really to realize the seven principles, you know, to be able to relate this information that's available in a scorecard to the outcomes we want to see for our family and our neighborhood. So. Mm -hmm. so one of these questions here asks about, you know, the Healthy Primary Care Dashboard will be helpful snap snapshot in time, but can we ask questions and project the future? And I think a really interesting example of that is capacity. There is no way we're gonna meet current capacity expectations. That, you know, there's tremendous shortage and you know, primary care is not gonna look the same. We're never gonna get back to the model that, you know, that, that we used to have. And so if you look at this data, then you can start to say, okay, you know, primary care capacity is declining. Um, we're gonna need some innovative solutions. And it's not just, you know, how do we, for example, how do we use technology better to get some of this, you know, administrative things that clinicians spend time that really shouldn't be clinician time spent doing? How, how do we, what are some, you know, effective, innovative, efficient things that we should think about? And so when you look at the scorecard and you say, okay, we're in a bad place, it's getting worse, we're never gonna get to where we're gonna, gonna be what do we do about this? And then start those conversations. So I think that that's one way that it can really uh, be forward looking. Uh, we've heard the uh, panelists talk about how it'd be great for every state to have a state level scorecard. How do we get there for the states that, that aren't there? What, if you know, there are uh, leaders in the room who would love to see this happen in their home states, who should they go to? Where do they start to get some of this work going? Well, I, I would, oh, go ahead. Well, please, on the scorecard, go ahead. It, obviously, um, just as we looked around and said, well, what's going on? I mean, if, <laughs> if you talk to your, your primary care clinicians and, and they, they tell you that, you know, they can't take on another thing or, you know, there's, there's, there's a sense of, of fragileness. And one of the things that, that's sort of a pet peeve of mine is, is in the newspaper, all you hear about hospitals, all through COVID, all you hear about hospitals because you know it, it's, it's more dramatic and, and they do, they have had a very hard time, but, but you don't hear anybody talking about primary care and what's going on. And, and one thing that Becca Etz had said is, um, that I think came from the primary care center is that there's no front door for primary care. So start a front door, pull together, as Larry said, you know, all the people who should care about this and get them in a room and start talking about it. And uh, Rachel, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that uh, to reiterate, to the extent that we have state level data available, this national scorecard will provide at least a jump start mm -hmm. for creating state level information and then empowering the kinds of groups that Barbara was just talking about to take it further in their individual states. So one of the challenges to overcome is that not all states have these all-payer claims databases. Not all states are using these consumer surveys, uh, things like that. So this will at least be the beginning of a level set uh, at a state level. But again, to stress, we will not have state level information for all states because of some of the limitations of the national data sets. But it would be a starting point. <coughs> 
<coughs> and for that table, that I, I, I do want to stress again that the states that have succeeded have been able to build, if not immediate unanimity on day one, have some of the folks who have a stake in primary care, get them together, have a conversation, look at the data that's going to be available from this dashboard, and say, how do we take this forward here in our state? There is, to I think Rachel's point, a lot of coordination and conversation going on that you might want to be part of so you can learn from other what other states have been able to do. This is not just an East Coast or West Coast situation. The state of Utah is now measuring primary care spend. First because of the leadership of the Utah Academy of Family Physicians, now because of a law that passed. The state of Nebraska has a law passed, doesn't have an APCB, is trying to figure out how to actually set a target on primary care spend. There is a quarterly call, PCC convenes, if your organization or individuals, normally those are restricted to members, if you know a state official, if you know a state advocate, those folks are allowed on this particular quarterly call that we co-convene with our friends at Millbank. Be part of that conversation. Um, reach out to us and, and we'll get you uh, connected into it. And you'll get to hear the details of uh, that web tool when it, or the, sorry, the uh, um, dashboard when it's um, uh, up and running. Again, a final pitch on this. PCC at our website has a link on our home page it says primary care investment and you can get to a searchable web tool we couldn't have done it without again support from partners Millbank in particular where you're able to look at the various legislations and regulations states have done there'll be a set of resources oh look like it's coming up on your screen look at uh, there'll be a link to a resource page uh, this is what it looks like, our primary care investment hub. See what states have been able to do. Um, and if you go to the next slide, there's literally all the states that have enacted bills that specifically have to do invest, uh, measuring investment in primary care. There's a lot more to this. The dashboard's going to measure that we have to measure. Um, but that's one piece we've been able to contribute to the conversation. Um, thanks. thanks for mentioning that, Larry. So, so, you know, one of the messages there is get legislation passed at the state level. That's one way to do it. Yeah. So, and we um, haven't had legislation mm. passed yet, but, but it's been proposed and that, that'll mm -hmm. start the conversation. Yeah. I'll just note that I see Karen Johnson, AAFP is convening uh, state chapter leadership to support their involvement and impact mm -hmm. at the state level in this too. That's a, a powerful leader and set of foot soldiers in those state level conversations here. Absolutely. So in the final minutes uh, that we have left on the panel, I'll just invite um, anyone to remark on how you want, we've talked a lot about these scorecards. How do you want the scorecards to be used? Uh, and I'll, I'll just, uh, I can start off because there's a question about community health plans. And I think just hearing that data about, in, uh, for example, MA plans and the very low investment in primary care is very disturbing and surprising. And so I think having very granular data by line of business and specific to plans to be able to know so they can compare and improve upon that, that investment would be helpful. In addition, workforce data we talked about too, uh, something that's of great concern to our health plans and having more insight and transparency would, would be helpful. So, But any of, of our panelists, would you like to? Yeah, I would say that we're starting out at the state level because that's where we're starting. Um, but absolutely, I mean, we're an organization that has uh, provided comparative performance information for clinicians um, so they can see how their peers compare, you know, for, for years. And it's a very powerful tool. So the first year we're going to get it at the level, at the state level, but then we want to drill down on every, everything we can. And um, I was looking at the Oregon um, that they have by commercial insurer, like how much their primary care spend is, you know, for each of the plans. And I think that's a really important way to go so that you can start some competition and say, okay, we'll get our primary care spend down. And another thing is for medical schools. I mean, Massachusetts has a lot of medical school. One of our metric is how many Massachusetts medical students go into primary care. And, you know, it's kind of laughable, right? But if we start saying which, prime, which medical schools and how many graduates they have, um, you know, maybe again, maybe that's something we can do. I, I think, you know, there's so much, and, and definitely by system, how much of the primary care um, 
the funding to a system is going to primary care. And this is a complete black hole, as you know. Like you have no idea when the money goes into a, a, a system, like how much comes down to primary care. And, and we've been, <laughs> we, in, in preparation for this idea that we'll have 30% more spend, we started talking to our, our, our systems about, is there a way that we could be consistent in how we measure this increased spend to primary care and they said, there's no way. It's just, it's just, it's too complicated. So we have a lot of work to do. Indeed. And if I could just briefly add, um, so it's very easy to talk about the deficiencies that currently exist, but we know that there are extraordinary successes. Uh, many people in this room and the award ceremony last night mm -hmm. uh, shared some of those. So as part of our report, we'll have some sidebars mm -hmm. of successful examples of organizations across the country that have tackled some of these key issues. And then we will also reference how we could envision the scorecard information to be used to advance the policy objectives that were included in the NASM report, because that is really what the scorecard was designed to do. And just that's the best way I could des describe or differentiate potentially one aspect in which our scorecard will be different but complementary to the HHS because a federal scorecard will be different than a national scorecard. The national scorecard is designed to empower and support every part of the system, which the NASM committee uh, ex described in great detail of who needs to be accountable for the actions that need to occur here. But they will be complementary to the federal priorities. Thank you. That's a really good point. Five Let seconds. A um, couple questions about inclusion of Medicaid data and whether we control for equity of access on data. This is vital. As a society, we can't afford to have ideal primary care in the Tonia suburbs, leave behind so many other communities, um, whether it be in city suburbs or rural areas. And uh, but the key of thousand journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step that's beginning to measure these things, beginning to track it, all the great work here, so. Thank you, that's a wonderful way to end our panel. Thank you so much for uh, your leadership and work on this and for this wonderful discussion. <laughs>